Hey, fellow mathematicians, welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And we're here to suggest that mathematizing is not about mimicking or rote memorizing, but it's about thinking and reasoning, about creating and using mental relationships. That math class can be less like it has been for so many of us and more like mathematicians learning and working together. We answer the question, if not algorithms, then what? So we've been asking for you to send us questions that you want to be answered. Last week, we had Pam tackle one question, and today we're going to tackle another one. So this week's question is from Rachel Adler. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for your podcast and resources. I am most likely in the minority, being that I'm becoming a teacher and not currently a teacher. Oh, we're so happy you're listening to the podcast. Yay. I love math and actually worked as a data analyst for the past 10 years. I love data and everything it can tell us. You can slice and dice it in so many ways to see something truly exciting and eye-opening. I want to bring my data analysis tricks into the classroom as a way to assess the learning opportunities with my students. My question for you is, what sort of questions do you think can be answered through data analytics to help drive the lessons? I'm thinking more along the lines of formative assessment opportunities that I can tag and analyze, not just scores on a test. And then also, Rachel says, also, most importantly, do you have any advice for the first year teaching? Okay, so we're going to tackle those one at a time. So okay. can you remind me later because I'm going to I'm going to go off on the first question uh, okay. a little bit first. So let's like first of all, welcome to teaching. Woo! Yay! Woo! And Excellent. my 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 most um, I'm actually going to give you this little bit of advice: survive your first year. Right. <laughs> like don't right. don't don't quit after your first year. Keep going. It gets better. Yep. And no matter how good your first year is, it will get better. No matter how bad your first year is, it will get better. So hang in there. Teaching is tough and it, uh, it asks a lot and it is worth every bit of it. Do do try to get in a good place. That's helpful. So let's talk about this question that you asked. You said you're a data analyst. You like to work with data. That's phenomenal. I love to work with data. Joe Bowler has just come out with some really nice data talks. So a thing that I would point you to is to look at her data talks. I call them problem talks that deal with data. I like to have sort of the general term called problem talks that that means we're going to give students a problem. We're going to raise a problem, raise it, an issue, a number, a, a graph, a, pro, a function, a, a whatever. And then we're going to a set of data and we're going to ask students to solve that problem. And so I don't really call them data talks. I call them problem talks about data. But if you look for Joe Bowler, with the, the, we'll put the link in the show notes. Uh, Joe Bowler's data talks um, have some really nice uh, things that you could look at that could maybe help you a little bit. Not really with your question, but uh, at least about using data. So then your question was, what sort of questions do you think can be answered through data analytics to help drive the lesson and specifically not just scores on a test? I got to be honest with you. I've been thinking about that a little bit. And um, I, I will say, I'll tell you a little bit of experience that we had. Several years ago, when I began teaching, I was teaching in Michigan. Uh, shout out to Michigan. Yay. I had a great time there. Loved it. Taught with some phenomenal people. When I was teaching there, one of the things that was just beginning to happen were high stakes tests. Mm -hmm. So that dates me just a little bit when I was beginning teaching. And um, so our students were about to take, now this is one of the very first high stakes tests that came out. It wasn't tied to um, a class at all, to subject. So it was kind of like, hey, we think ninth grade kids should be able to answer these questions. And so <laughs> some of us were a little bit um, irritated is a good word, maybe mm -hmm. uh, frustrated that um, our kids were going to be, our students were going to be tested on things they should have learned before us. So some of that was data. And it, honestly, it was one of the first times that I'd ever heard of a box and whisker plot. I was like, what if, what is that? A stem and leaf plot? I'm like, I don't, they, they were supposed to learn that in middle school. Okay. Uh, and so we were charged as high school teachers to review that this data stuff that they uh, specifically graphs to represent data that the kids were supposed to have learned before us. So we kind of helped each other out a little bit. And my colleagues, uh, at least some of them decided that, that they were going to teach kind of like a, a whole like class, a unit, uh, like they were going to take time out and teach the thing. And I said, I wonder if I could just kind of wrap it into what I'm teaching. Mm. And the way that I decided to do that was every time we took something that was graded. So I gave a lot of short quizzes in my class. Um, I would call those formative, though I did grade them and then tests uh, in, in my high school classes. And so every time, especially uh, when I gave a test, so I didn't do all the quizzes because I gave a lot of them, but every time I gave a test, I would grade the test and then I would put up their test scores in a histogram. 
And I would say, all right, what can you tell us now with no names attached? Of course not. Of course, that would be yeah. shaming and that's not good. Um, but with no names attached, just the, 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 the numbers and they can sort of see, you know, how, like how many A's, how many B's? Well, well, it depended on how I set the bin width, right? Like if you think of a histogram, histograms are all about bins and however many data points are in those bins is how tall the bin is in that histogram. Um, and so how wide you make the bins, I could have shown. Uh, sort of A minuses. I could have shown half grades, or if I made the bin, if, if I put them at five points, and if I put them at ten points, then I could have showed whole grades. How many students got an A or B? Or if I put them at, and yes, I did hundred point scale uh, back then when I was teaching. And so if I put the bins even wider, in fact, I'll just let you guys think for a second. How wide would the bin had if, had to have been in order for me to just show pass fail? Like that could have been a thing, right? Um, and so we could just we could, and, and I always did this on technology. So I, I believe in the power of technology to, to look at uh, things quickly, to be able to have the power of visualization. So I would have put their scores um, in a graphic calculator and I would have shown that histogram and then, and then changed the bins quickly. And so they could, we could sort of ask and answer a lot of questions about the data. Then I would show a corresponding box and whisker plot. And then we sort of learned about, you know, we'd already, we'd already kind of analyzed the data on the histogram. And then we would kind of learn about a box and whisker plot by comparing. What do you see? Same data, but in two different representations. And so what, what comes out in a box and whisker that doesn't come out in a histogram? Well, outliers show up. What else could happen? Uh, the, the idea of the median shows up. Um, and the quartiles are, are kind of there. Um, you can kind of see range in both. Anyway, I'm sort of talking about the different representations, but you can you can see different things in different, which is why we have different representations, right? Because different uh, measures of center and things can, can be shown better in different representations. So I would do that with their grades. And then um, depending on the day and how much time we had and everything, um, I might spend less time on analyzing the histogram and the box and whisker. And I might spend more time in showing the box and whisker for their grades and second period, like I showed first period, mm -hmm. second period, third period, fourth period, sixth period. And, and then I might be like, hey, y'all quit cheating. Quit, quit, yeah. telling, quit telling your friends later in the day about the questions on the test. Look how their scores are getting better. To which I will tell you, my students always push back and said, oh, you're just getting better at teaching by seventh period. Oh. So, there <laughs> so we had a little bit, you know, we, we, we enjoyed each other and could kind of joke about that a little bit. So honestly, Rachel, that's one way I tried to use data to sort of analyze some things and, and use that to um, help kind of drive the learning in my class. I think it also sort of drove a little bit where kids could kind of see, oh, well, I know what grade I got. Now I could kind of see what other kids are getting. I never wanted it to shame kids. I only wanted it to help them maybe see possibilities of, oh, wow, other kids are doing better in here. Maybe maybe I can get extra help or maybe I can ask more questions or take the homework seriously or, you know, like whatever uh, to improve. I, I hoped it wasn't a shaming thing. If the time we spent and the, the emphasis was on how the data was being represented, um, not not where their scores fit in. Um, so that's, that's a, a thought. I know you said specifically more formative assessment opportunities. Um, I'm curious, Rachel, shoot me another email. I'd, I'd love to hear more kind of about how you're thinking about using formative assessment opportunities to tag and analyze than, than the scores on the test that I just told you about. Those are, uh, hopefully that gave you some idea. Oh, actually one other, one other thing I wanted to mention, I can think about I, another way that we that I collect data now that I didn't so much as a younger teacher, and that is more with a landscape of learning approach. Mm, so Kathy yeah. Fosno talks about her landscape of learning and where students sort of are uh, in their development as mathematicians. So I've created landscapes of learning. Kathy Fosno has created landscapes of learning for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, decimals, percents. Um, I think she's created some new ones for geometry that I haven't seen yet. But I, I've created ones for high school. So for linear functions, exponential functions, quadratic functions, we are working right now and getting that out to the world. So stay tuned. Uh, my team knows that whenever I say we're about to, that we're <laughs> six months from now. So it's not quite ready to, but, but, but high school teachers just know that that's coming. But if I think about a landscape of learning, it's much more about landmark models, big ideas, and strategies. It's not about grades. We advocate uh, taking that landscape of learning and kind of noting where students are. Oh, this student is owning this model. This student is developing this model. This student is uh, really using this strategy a lot, but I don't ever see this strategy, even though the numbers or the structure would, would sort of beg this strategy. I don't see them using that. Oh, I would note that on a landscape of learning. To me, that's a little bit more of kind of a single data point 
So I'm, I'm a little, maybe that now when I tell you that, Rachel, you can think more uh, because you're the data analyst, you can think more about how you might, if I, if I look at a single, a single student, I have sort of these not own yet developing and using well kind of markers on this landscape of learning for these different kind of uh, junctures of models, big ideas and strategies. So I, maybe you could help me. How, how would you use those data points to, to drive learning? Uh, and I'd be curious to know. Now your second question. Your second question was, do you have any advice for your first year teaching? Yes. But Kim, I'm going to let you start. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So the first year, wow, it's, it's been a minute, but, um, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of have just referred a minute, to this, just a minute. Um, we referred to this in a different podcast episode and I don't remember exactly which one it was, we'll but put it in the notes. Yeah. yeah. So, so the sooner that you can get solid on your belief system, right? You and I both talked about know your kids, know your content. That's kind of a, it's huge. It's kind of a mantra. The sooner that you can get solid on your beliefs, what you believe about teaching and learning, the better off that you'll be. Because then everything that you do, every decision you make will be through that lens. You won't be the person who sways back and forth all the time. And maybe- I'll try this. I'll try that. No, this, no, that. Shiny, run. Well, And maybe even more importantly- you'll be able to identify partners that have the same belief system because I firmly believe that finding a teaching partner is so crucial. I was so blessed to have some really solid teaching partners over the years and they make a huge difference. Yeah, so, I can I can definitely, I, in my first teaching experience, the gentleman that hired me, Scott Hendrickson, still may be the best teacher I've ever met. Yeah amazing, amazing guy. And I was so blessed to work with him the first two years because it just set the stage. And then a little less in my next, uh, well, the next place that I went, it was sort of me and eight men. And we talked a lot about uh, football and uh, and it, it was entertaining, but they, they weren't sort of mathematics teaching colleagues. We had very differing beliefs about how kids can learn and how, what teaching means and grades and equity and all sorts of things. And so, wow, after having it and then not having it, I would concur. Look for teaching colleagues that can be helpful. Now in the age of social media, you can find those teaching colleagues uh, on Twitter. I highly recommend uh, MTBOS um, on Twitter, the MitBoss group. The I teach math group. Those are places where you can find teaching colleagues that can help. Kim, I think I may have cut you off. Sorry. No, it's okay. Are you good? Yeah. Okay. So then I would add a couple of maybe other things for you to think about in your first year. Ray Barton, I, I give credit to this. He was a T cube instructor. I went to a workshop that he gave right when I was beginning teaching. I will never forget him saying these words. He said, Teachers, get out of the four walls of your room, or over time, they will collapse in on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, in that moment, he was teaching this workshop and I said, I want to be you. I want to grow up. And someday I want to give workshops to teachers. Woo! I mean, I, was, I, I remember thinking that as a first year teacher, that, that that's a thing that I wanted to do. Now, maybe that's not your goal. Maybe you don't want to grow up and, and um, grow up. I'm, I'm using that a little facetiously, but maybe that's not your career goal to become a teacher educator. But maybe your career goal is just to, to be a great classroom teacher, and that's marvelous, and I can totally support that. But but don't stay within the four walls of your room, or over time, they will collapse in on you. So get out. Go to, to teaching conferences. Um, tons of stuff like that online now, but get out of yourself. Uh, Robert Kaplinsky uses the observe me movement. Um, invite people into your room. Invite their comment. Invite their, their reflection on your practice. The more that you can do that, the faster and better you'll grow um, right. as a teacher. Um, another little thing that I would suggest, I, I used to hear teachers say, um, don't smile till October. So I I don't agree in that. I definitely would smile. However, it is far easier to loosen up than it is to tighten down. Mm. So you're not there to be their friend. You are there to be their teacher. And I would highly recommend that you think through the way you want the first couple months of your year to go and then consider sort of loosening up. So it's not about being ugly. It's not about being mean. It's definitely not about shaming. 
but um, I would definitely be a little bit more of a stricter, hard nose. Uh, that doesn't fly in here. This is what we do in here. So I'm setting the stage in here until uh, until about I don't know the end of October, and then, and then I could kind of relax a little bit, and and they would just sort of carry on. Uh, for example, when they walked in my room, they knew that from bell to bell we were working. There was no downtime. There was no um, uh, playing around. There was no late start. There was a, if you've ever been to a workshop, I do. I always say, I believe in starting and ending on time. And I do, I believe in starting and ending on time. And during that time we're working. And so I, I would ache every first month of school because I never sat down. I was up. I was circulating. We were doing stuff. I was asking kids questions. We were communicating. We were setting the stage for class that we work in here. We, we were thinking in here. Um, and then, then come November, then I could kind of, I, I could, I could like take a little break and kids would still walk in the room. Okay. All right. What are we doing today? Like, mm -hmm. not like frantic or anything, but like, like clear that we work in here. Um, and so set that stage early, set it well, and then it's always easier to lighten up than to, to, to tighten up. It's, it's, uh, tightening up just kind of doesn't work. It's really hard to do. Yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to add in one more thing that, yeah, um, yeah. that relationships matter so much. Mm. And anything that you can do to form bonds with your kids, students, is so important. If, if, you, if you can get them to trust you, then so much will be easier through the rest of the year. So much more will happen. Not even yeah. just easier, but happen, right? Yeah. Happen at all. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's not, a, that's not about being their friend. Right. It's about, it's about a good teacher-student relationship. Right. But, but when but they- you when, care that you care. Yeah. That you honest, honestly believe in them, that you will help them. They show that they, you know, care that you're, you're there for them. You believe in them. Um, all of that is so, so important. Um, I'll just share a quick story. Uh, there was a moment in about halfway through a semester where I had two senior girls that were in my class. Um, this was after several years at this particular high school. And, uh, we were chatting one day and one of them goes, what's with you? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And they're like, Dude, when we knew we were in your class, which by the way, dude, what is this dude thing for women? I don't know, I mean, whatever. Anyway, yeah. so they're like, dude, like um, we th when we landed in your class, we were like, oh no, like this is going to be terrible. She's so stern. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and they're like, you're not like that at all. And I was kind of chuckling a little bit and I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, your reputation around the school is that you are you work people hard like that that your class is is difficult but doable and fair mm -hmm. and that you are stern and they're like you're not really stern you're just a big softy you just kind of come off that way at first and i was like sweet that is a great reputation <laughs> like I, I was love now i taught high school so maybe you're a little more touchy feely at the younger grades um but I was really clear at that high school level that we were working hard and, and, and I loved the fact that then they said I was fair and yeah. that my class was doable. Yeah. That's so um, great. I'm going to, I'm going to share a quick story. This Kim doesn't know I'm going to share. Um, I walked into my kid's school. So Kim was my kid's teacher, right? Like not all the time, but, but she taught at the same school. And I walked into that elementary school. She, Kim taught third, fourth and fifth grade. Um, one day and I, uh, there were, there were these big doors at the beginning of the hallway and I opened that big door and Kim had a couple kids and she was kind of letting them have it a little bit. She was very sternly saying, this is not acceptable in, in our class. We don't do that. We do this. And she was very, like, she did all the good positive things about identifying clearly what wasn't acceptable and then identifying clearly what was acceptable. And this is, and, and I believe in you guys followed. Uh, so it was, this is a sort of stern and then followed very much with like, I believe in you and we're going to make, and this is what we do here. And it was very positive. And then uh, she sent them back in class. Now that whole time, high energy, high, like, like, like eyeball. She, she's like looking <laughs> in their faces and they, they walked back in the room. These two kids walked back and she looked at me. She's like, Oh, Hey Pam, how's it going? <laughs> I will never forget like this whole demeanor change. It was like, Oh yeah. How's, you know, like she, it, what I learned from that, she was completely in control the whole time. Now, don't they, don't hear me wrong. She wasn't like ranting or screaming or anything. It was just this very like clear, like stern, like serious, like, yeah. oh, I believe in you. Like we are going to make this positive thing happen. And then, and it was all back to like normal, like, ah, yeah, hey, what's going on? You know, <laughs> anyway, so, so have, have control of yourself. Like you're, yeah. especially the older you teach, I think teachers have to sort of figure out their own baggage. And you have to kind of figure out how you fit for, I'll just, here, I'll be a little vulnerable and, and upfront. 
I had to kind of figure out how I fit with the popular kids, with the jocks, with the like whatever sort of section of kids there were. All of a sudden I had to realize, whoa, I'm treating them like the insecure kid I was in high school. I'm the mm-hmm. teacher. I have to be the adult here. And, and it took me a minute, a, a hot minute to figure out kind of my place as an adult. I think it's important for teachers to do that work. If you don't do that work, you're going to be like the student teacher I had, <sighs> who I will never name his name. Your name is safe with me. I will never say anything negative about you. Uh, but he literally stood up in front of my classes and said, my name is Mr. So-and-so, and I, uh, but you can call me God because I am the God of math. Oh, geez. And he could not hear that when they would ask a question, he would, they, you know, a sincere question. He would say, I, I, I taught that. I showed you that. I, I, I taught you how to do that. Don't, uh, uh. he was, he, he was so like insecure in himself. He had dealt with his own stuff yet that he then was not a very effective teacher. So mm. the, uh, I would highly recommend that again, get those good teacher colleagues that can help right. you. Uh, monitor and reflect on your own teaching practice. Um, there's some some sort of non-mathy uh, first year advice. I hope you guys um, that come here for math advice didn't mind that we sort of took a little track on non-mathy advice there for first year teachers. Excellent. <laughs> kind of All fun. right. So remember to join us on Math Strat Chat on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram on Wednesday evenings where we explore problems with the world. And if you find the podcast helpful, please rate it and give us a review. That way more people can find it wherever they get podcasts and we can spread the word more that math is figure out of Keep bringing your uh, suggestions and comments. We love hearing from you. So if you're interested to learn more math and you want to help yourself and students develop as mathematicians, then don't miss the Math is Figureoutable podcast because math is figureoutable.